the minstrel in the gallery. Welcome to Prog Chattery 777. Had to open with that. Obviously, we're talking about Jethro Tull. We've made it to 1975. We're talking about the minstrel in the gallery. Um, I think this is absolutely classic Jethro Tull. Um, like I said, I, I, I think of Thick as a Brick as being, you know, possibly one of my, possibly my favorite Jethro Tull album because it is one of my favorite albums ever. You know, I, I listened to Thick as a Brick at the right age and it, it really, it really captured something for me. But, um, you know, in all honesty, I mean, Minstrel in the Gallery, I think, might be objectively Jethro Tull's greatest album. I think, I, I absolutely love this record. Um... Ian Henderson's got reservations about it. Again, it, it's it's funny. It's funny, but um, you hearing hearing the audience, the the artist's um, perception of some of this work. Um, and I think Anderson's criticism of it is, you know, some of the lyrics are a bit too personal, a bit too dreary, or whatever. But I think that I think that uh, that gives it its strength. I mean, they are they are very honest, relatable human lyrics, right? Um, yeah, there, there's there's a. I think Anderson was going through some relationship troubles at the time, um, breakdown of a marriage or a relationship. I'm not really too sure. I mean, I'm typically more interested in the music than the than the personal lives of uh, these wonderful, wonderful artists. But uh, you could tell. I think he was feeling a little glum when he wrote the lyrics. But um, I mean, as an album, uh, it it's not a concept album or anything, but it it is still in that kind of Jethro Tull proggy style. Uh, although at this point he they have kind of abandoned the rich the the wider instrumentation um, like on Passion Play and War Child we get lots of saxophones like the accordion becomes a big thing on War Child um, you know, lots of different bits of percussion in that and this is kind of a return to the known classic tall sound this is a return to Aqualung sound really where we get that uh, contrast between the acoustic guitars and the electric guitars like the acoustic folky stuff with the rock stuff blended together. Um, but this is, I think this is so much better than Aqualung. I'm going to be totally honest with you. I think Minstrel in the Gallery knocks Aqualung out of the park. Um, obviously Aqualung is a classic, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it isn't, because it is a wonderful album, but this is, you know, this has got an extra four years of experience to inform it, and, uh, I think they get the balance a lot, a lot better. I think the flow of the album is much better. The production of the album is much, much better than Aqualung as well. Um, as you can see, I'm, I've got my big fancy 40th anniversary awesome package. Um, but the original album actually did sound quite good. Um, Stephen Wilson does the remix on this, and of course Stephen Wilson did a fantastic job, as he does. Um, but yeah, Minstrel in the Gallery is, is an absolutely classic piece. Um, we get the... Uh, their, kind of the last big epic that Tull did. They, they would do longer songs later in their career, obviously, but uh, uh, we got Baker Street Muse, which is about, uh, what was it, 15 minutes, I think? Something like that? 15, 16 minutes? And I, yeah, it, it's brilliant. It, it, it takes, Baker Street Muse takes all the things that were good about Thick as a Brick and um, Passion Play and shrinks it down so that we can have a, a taste of some of the other stuff that Tom are doing as well. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We, we, we talk about the songs in order, and I already, I already skipped to side two, which is unacceptable. Um, so, uh, side one opens with the title track. Uh, I, lo I love the very opening of the album. We get some of the, uh, a little bit of banter and whatnot, and uh, we hear, my lord and lady, we have for you some strumming players. And then uh, you hear someone whisper into Anderson's ear, like, oh, are you going to be able to go through with it? Oh, yes, I hope so. That kind of little backstage chatter moments before taking the stage. I, li I, love, I love that. Um, you hear the little bit of applause, and then we get that wonderful... The minstrel in the gallery. So good. And we get uh, the wonderful, you know, brilliant, brilliant Ian Anderson guitar playing. Um... I mean, his, his acoustic guitar playing is just phenomenal, and again, like the, you know, he's such a master at writing great melodies, and there, there's some great melodies in that, in that opening section of Minstrel in the Gallery, and the way that, the, the way that he um, arranges the acoustic guitar to complement the melodies he's singing, uh, he was just such a master at that. I mean, he, he, Anderson really is a, a phenomenal songwriter. I think he, he deserves more acclaim for, for what he's done. He's, he's an absolute 
genius with melody and rhythm. Um, and the 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 song kind of the lyrically, it's talking about uh, the relationship between the uh, performer and the audience. Uh, and there's some great witty lines in there. Um, the old man's cackle and oh, uh, it, it is it is a classic, classic, uh, classic bit of tall. Now it goes into a big middle section, which is led by Martin Barr. I think it was written by Martin Barr. Um, and in fact, a lot of the, the stage shows, of course, you know, the band would have their showcases, and uh, Martin Barr would have these really cool, uh, heavy riffy, heavy riff kind of uh, instrumental compositions that he'd bring to the table, and that would be his little highlight of the show. And uh, they included one as the mid the middle section of Minstrel in the Gallery, and it, it's phenomenal. There, there's some wonderful playing. I mean, there, there, there's some insanely, insanely tight playing between. Um, uh, Jeffrey Hammond, Hammond, and uh, uh, Barry Barlow, uh, just like like and a lot of stop start kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, you, you, know, you you can hear the Dream Theater. We could have probably took a few a few notes out of that middle section. Um, I, I hear I hear a lot of influence actually. Um, you know, Dream Theater obviously we're taking taking a listen I guess. They they took a listen from a lot of people a lot of people but that section reminds me of kind of dream theater type stuff. Um, of course, when Tall was doing it, it was a lot more original, a lot fresher. Um, and then all this the crazy instrumental awesomeness winds its way into the big riff, and we get the the main part of Minstrel in the Gallery, uh, and that is one of the great Jethro Tall riffs, uh, and it, it it's heavy. You know, overall, this is a really, really heavy album. I mean, like I said, there is a really healthy balance between the acoustic flavors and the heavy flavors, but when the heavy stuff comes in, it really rocks. Uh, Mints for the Gallery is certainly no exception. That uh, uh, that riff is just so good, and the, the flute comes up onto it. Oh, it, you know, it, it really is, it, tonally, it's a really nice sound, the flute coming over top of the Martin's guitar. To, to play along that little melody, that riff, and uh, oh, it's phenomenal. And we get a reprise of the lyrics from the first uh, first section, and I, I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and let me say this: "Minstrel in the Gallery," the title track, is I think Ian Anderson's greatest vocal performance of the '70s. Uh, I mean, he is just giving her. His voice sounds so good. I mean, particularly right around the end, um, and I mean, he's he's just singing the title of the the title of the song, and I mean, he's just Ah, it's so good. Um, there's a lot of great little embellishments in the arrangement too. Um, uh, da, 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 ba, 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 ba. That like little things that only pop up once. <laughs> it probably looked funny as you're watching that, but you know what I'm talking about. You've heard the song. Um, yeah, it's great. Absolute Jethro Tull classic. One of my favorite Jethro Tull songs. Uh, track two is Cold Wind of Valhalla, then the, the, the momentum of the album just keeps on going. Uh, the Viking song, the song about Vikings. It's got some fantastic uh, orchestral arrangements, again courtesy of David Palmer. You've been hearing a lot of him, he's been around right since, right since this was, and not long after this he would finally, finally join the band. Uh, but he hadn't joined yet. Um, but yeah, anyway, the, the orchestral arrangements of Cold Wind of Valhalla are, are great. Um, you know, I said it, it's got that Viking flavor, so it's a fast-paced acoustic thing that starts it out, and uh, then it launches into into exquisite riffery. I mean, it, riffery, exquisite riffery. Um, kind of similar to the previous song. We it starts with acoustic, and then it goes into the heavy stuff. Uh, and the heavy stuff almost reminds me of some you know classic Led Zeppelin. Uh, really, really, really good. Um, Martin Barr does some great slide work on the old, on the old electric. Um, and again, his voice is so good, and and the lyrics are, are wonderful too. You know, we're running a bit short on heroes lately. <laughs> I love I love those witty little uh, remarks. Um, it, it, it's a very urban album. I think that that that's something notable. Uh, I'm digressing a bit, but. Um, you know, album the, the album's kind of pre pre seventy six, uh, so you know, still including this one. This is nineteen seventy five. Um, I have a very urban feel, even though it, it it is it is very folky and whatnot. There there is an urbanness to what they're doing. I mean, he was a city guy. He was living on Baker Street, 
uh, at the time. And uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Because Baker Street Muse is coming up soon. Not yet, though. Uh, so yeah, Coldwind to Valhalla is really good. Um, and that leads us into track three, which is Black Satin Dancer. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful, dramatic, dramatic love song. Um, I believe it's about uh, two lovers in their final, uh, their final encounter together. They know, they know the thing is over and they know it's done, but they still, they still want one more taste of the honey. If you want, if you catch my drift. Um, and it's really, really good. Uh, it, it kind of very dramatic, sneaky um, intro. And then it goes into a tender ballad, which is which is very sweet. The melody is, you know, heart wrenching and lovely piano uh, embellishments, courtesy of John Evan. And uh, it goes into the middle section, which just again, it just totally rocks. It goes from that acoustic flavor right into the the wild rocky flavor very very quickly, and uh, it's wonderful. We get an absolutely inspired flute performance by uh, by Ian Anderson. I think he just totally overloaded on the saxophones in the previous three albums, and, uh, you know, I think he was quite happy to return to just being the flautist again, uh, and guitar player and singer, obviously, but, uh, yeah, the, he, he gets so into it, and it's that classical, uh, early Anderson flout, flute playing where, uh, you know, he's like, bah, 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 bah. He's, he's screaming into it, and making silly noises and, and all, all the rest of it and uh, it, it's a it's a classic piece uh, then uh, the first side wraps up with track four requiem um, nice little uh, acoustic piece just uh, just Ian Anderson and his acoustic guitar with a bit of uh, orchestration and uh, it, it, it is lovely it, it, it's uh, Goes, it goes into that melancholy tone uh, that's that's present, like the, the beginning and ending of Black Satin Dancer. Um, but it is lovely. Um, you know, talking about seeing a lady on the on the side of the street, but you're so dejected that you don't care. Maybe I don't know. I, I hate talking about the lyrics. I try. I end up blurting something out about the lyrics, and I think, oh, that that's not what it's about. But uh, ignore that last comment. Thanks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Requ Requiem is a lovely little piece. Uh, then we flip the uh, old record over. We don't flip on this because we're in the digital age and we have been for 30 years, 30 plus years. Oh, God. Um, we get track five, uh, which opened side two originally. One white, doc, one white duck uh, slash zero to the power of ten equals nothing at all. Um, and they, they are kind of fused together. It's just it's kind of a medley of two of the little songettes that uh, Anderson was doing. Um... One White Duck is, again, it, it's very uh, very much in the, the vein of a ballad. It's very melancholy, um, but quite beautiful. And again, we, we get some great or orchestral bits, um, you know, the plucked violins. Um, and it, again, it's such a beautiful beautiful melody, that One White Duck on Your Wall. And I just destroyed it. <laughs> um, but it, it, it the chorus has a really lovely melody, and again, the way it's orchestrated is wonderful. His voice is... is Beautiful, really, really well done. Uh, and then we go to zero, the power of ten equals nothing at all. And this is a little bit more upbeat and a little bit more energetic. Um, it's almost, almost could be sarcastic, maybe. Um, and uh, I, I think, I think the or the orchestra is less present on zero to the power of ten, nothing at all. But it, it's such a high energy little romp with uh, with Anderson on the acoustic and. Uh, Again, his voice, it was just, th this album is the peak of his singing in the 70s. It is just so ripe with character, and it's so, uh, so animated, and he's, he's just, he's just such an entertainer. And it, it, com it comes out, you know, it, it's just in the way he sings. You know, like, um, I'm, I'm a something on skate, yet, <laughs> you know, the, the, the little, the little vocal embellishments that make all the difference. And, uh, you know, like I said, he's a master of melody, so, I mean, it, it just seems so effortless. You know, he was never a classically trained singer. He never really took singing lessons, but, uh, you know, he was just, he had such a great instinct for melody and such a good instinct for um, delivering that and using his voice to that great effect. You know, he's never had a great range as a singer. It's, it's, not, it's not that he can hit this note way up here and then, you know, several octaves down, he can hit the low notes. It's just the tone and the sound of his voice that makes it so rich and makes it so fun. Um, and Zero to the Power of the Ten is a great example of that. 
Uh, then we get track six. This is track two on the side two of the album. We get Baker Street Muse, uh, the big 16-minute epic. Um, like I said, it's all the all the things that made Thick as a Brick and Passion Play so good, but it's it's compacted enough uh, so that you can include you know more album on the album. Um, and then, yeah, it's it, it, it's quite again. It it is quite melancholy. It, it is a dark album. It, it's a sad album, but it, it you know as 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 we're gonna find out in the next couple of minutes as I talk about it, it, it is ultimately really really uh, uplifting in the end. And it it is it is um, you know it, there's there's it's got that redeeming factor at the end. Um, but yeah, Baker Street Muse is it, just just wonderful. Great great heavy guitar riff. There's great orchestration in it. Um, do 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 Great, uh, great drumming. I mean, the Barry Bar Barry Low Bar Barry Moore Barlow. Uh, like I said, he's such such an underrated drummer, and he's so he's so good at what he does, and he just delivers a great performance. Um, the the subtitles in Baker Street Muse, we get Pygmy and the Whore, Nice Little Tune, Crash Barrier Waltzer, and Mother England Reverie. Um. And there's some there's some great wordplay too. I mean, not not only is Anderson such a great so great with melody, he's he's a great wordsmith as well. And there's there's some really funny tongue in cheek lines. I think uh, um, during the pygmy and the whore section, um, I mean, just just take a look at his lyrics and kind of think about him. And you know, it's it's so tongue in cheek. It's so witty. It's so he's he's a he's a brilliant lyric writer as well. Um, uh, Crash Barrier Walter, again, that, that, that's a section that gets quite dark and quite uh, gloomy. Um, you know, that, that's the peak of the melancholy bit of the album. Um, but as the song winds up, it, it, like I said, it, it's got that great redeeming payback. Uh, one of the great lines is, uh, and if sometimes I sing to a cynical degree, it's just the nonsense that it seems. And I'm just at Baker Street Muse. <laughs> I get so into it when I talk about it. But that that line, um, you know, he's. I mean, obviously, I think he was dealing with some personal stuff when he was writing these songs, and uh, he was aware of that. I think he was probably using it as an outlet to deal with that, with that stuff. And uh, I think, I mean, he was he was certainly conscious that it, that was going to dominate the tone and the feel of the album. And so it's great that he throws that little line in there to show that self awareness. And I think, you know, that that almost that justifies the personal nature of the album. I think. Um, again, he's just such a good writer. I mean, I, I, I really envy his, uh, his knack for, you know, his knack for writing great songs. Um, and then Baker Street Music winds its way back to the big riff in that, and, uh, uh, the big finale, and then we, we hear the, the sound of Anderson walking through the studio, uh, kind of, you know, just singing to himself, whistling a little bit, locks, n knocks on the door, I can't get out! That's, that's a fun little bit of humor. Also, fun bit of humor, the very beginning of Baker Street Muse, like I said, this is the big 16-minute concept track of the album, and um, we, we hear the Baker Street Muse, take one. One, two, three, two, two, three, starts it, and then second bar screws it up. Oh, damn, shit, 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 take two. <laughs> so you get this huge, huge song, and the, 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 first, you know, the fact that he screws it up the, very, the first bar, I, I, I think that's a funny little joke. Um, and it shows that the humor was still very present. You know, it, it it is it is a dark album. It's 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 a melancholy album, but the sense of humor is still firmly ingrained there. Um, and after after break, Baker Street Muse, we get Grace, which is I think the peak of Ian Anderson's songettes. Um, it's just five lines, I think, and the song is 30 seconds long. And Oh, it's just it's just a it's just such a nice, lovely little ray of sunshine at the end of the album, and it, it's it's so short and and nicely understated, and uh, very very sweet. Um, yeah, it, it's it's one it's one of those heartstring tugger songs. And like I said, it, it's it, he had a, he had a great knack of songwriting. Is you know he only had the song is only thirty seconds long, but it, it uh, it's it's a profound little um, you know period at the end of the album. Uh, it's really really nice. Uh, so yeah, that that that's it. That's that's Mitch from the Gallery. Like, objectively their best album, and you know, I know I, I I'm probably gonna say this about a lot of their albums. Hey, this is my favorite album. 
Uh, obviously, I like Thick as a Brick an awful lot, but there is something so good about this. I guess it, it's if you if you like Aqualung and you think that's a classic, this is like Aqualung 2.0. I mean, it, it is it is better. <laughs> I, I, I'm just gonna come out and say it. I think this is much better than that than Aqualung. It's much heavier than Aqualung. I mean, it's got like I said, the rocky bits really do rock on here, but um, you know, it, it just it shows the excitement and energy of the band. It's 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 very unusual that. Uh, you know, they they kind of passed their peak at this point. It's 1975. They passed their peak of like international, global sensationness, um, and the the sales had started to fall on this. But it doesn't make any sense because I think this is, like I said, this is one of the, the pop, you know, possibly the strongest thing they'd done up to their career. It's certainly the strongest thing they did since Thick as a Brick. Um, and the other reason for that, as I mentioned with War Child, he was distracted with uh, putting a film together at the same time. Uh, when, when you put this together, I think they were just focusing on making a great album. Uh, they were also in Monte Carlo, so they were you know, hanging out in the lap of luxury as they recorded this. And they had the studio, there's the studio, that's the gallery, and then there are the minstrels. Uh, but yeah, like, I, like I've been saying, it's, it's a great album, uh, it's essential, you should check it out. Disc two on the special edition is a is a live concert from uh, Paris on the fifth of July, nineteen seventy five, um, and it's actually the the live concert was released before the uh, before the album. So there's not that I think they they play Minstrel in the Gallery. That's the only new song that they play, but it's great. It's got a live recording of Backdoor Angels on it, uh, Bungle in the Jungle, um, Wondering Aloud, Critique Oblique, the little section that they 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 kept from Passion Play, which is a great a great little moment. Uh, so that's that's good. Anyway, I'm wrapping it up for realsies. Uh, thanks for watching. You've been watching me chat about Minstrel in the Gallery, a fantastic album by a fantastic band, Jethro Tull. Stay tuned next time for uh, one that I'm not as big a fan of, uh, but we got to do it because we're doing them all. We're gonna talk about too old to rock and roll, too young to die. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. Send me a like, subscribe, and a comment if you like. And uh, we will see you in the future. See you later.